So we're going to hear from Mike Fulton first, Principal Architect with CC&C uh, Solutions, uh, and then from Dave Hornford, Managing Partner of Connexium, Luke Bradley, Principal Architect, Technology Shared Services Center with the Vodafone Group, and David Gilmore, who's Director with Panastra PTE Limited. So um, we'll take them in that order, and then we will, uh, after they've each made their short presentations, uh, we'll gather up here and have some questions. So please uh, get the questions coming in uh, uh, on the pads there. So uh, first up, please, uh, well, warm welcome for Mike Fulton. So unfortunately, they gave me the tough job of uh, following up after uh, Tony and Eric, who did a wonderful job sharing the, sharing a story about value. So we're, we've uh, we've got a tough uh, act to follow here. But um, before I jump into this, I did want to ask because uh, we just we just spent an hour on the topic of IT for IT, and the entire presentation we actually saw two very little pictures of IT for IT on one single slide, and we didn't see anything else of what is actually the IT for IT reference architecture. So how many of you actually know what uh, IT for IT is in a little, more, little bit more detail? Just show hands. Okay, so about half of the audience has some familiarity with IT for IT, which is great, but it means the uh, the other half of the audience need these next couple of slides, um, not that one. Uh, so what is uh, IT for IT? Um, IT for IT is, it says it's an evolving open group standard. It is still evolving. Um, it, as Tony said, it has been out there in the industry. It's getting a tremendous amount of traction, uh, but it will continue to evolve and improve uh, very rapidly over the next several years. Uh, so if you are an open group member, Love for you to get in there and uh, participate. Help us help us drive this standard forward as we continue to evolve it. Uh, IT for IT provides the capabilities that we need for managing the business of IT. Uh, as Tony mentioned, better, faster, cheaper, and safer uh, is is a is a great way to put that. It is industry independent, just like everything that we do in the open group, and it is designed to work with the existing landscapes of IT as well as the, the direction that IT is going as well. So uh, it's important to understand both of those. This is the IT value chain. This is a, a key piece of uh, IT for IT. I'm going to actually talk through three uh, key components of IT for IT to, to kind of warm us up here before we get into some of the case studies. Uh, the, the value chain and the value streams is an incredible incredibly important piece of, of what we've done with IT for IT. This business orientation using the Porter value chain model uh, is something that's unique to this standard. It's not something that's been done with other IT management frameworks, and it's, uh, it's a critical part of making this resonate with uh, various uh, audiences, with C-level executives uh, across the industry. So I think uh, we can't oversell that. The second piece here, and since I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to go pretty fast on this, but uh, the second key piece, and, and, and Eric's really highlighted this a little bit, is this concept of an IT service model. This is, again, unique, uh, in my opinion, to IT for IT. This idea of really following a service from uh, its inception in a conceptual form uh, through logical detail and then into the actual physical realization of the service uh, when it goes into a production environment. That's something, again, that is very unique to IT for IT that I think is, is important to know and understand if you're new to, if you're new to the concept. And then the, um, the third key component here, uh, beyond the, the business value orientation, the service orientation, is the IT for IT reference architecture. And if you've not seen this picture before, it really is made up of four distinct pieces. The functional components, which are the blue boxes. Uh, the data objects, which are the black circles. Uh, relationships, which is the, the lines between the, uh, between the circles. And then that service backbone, uh, the purple uh, circles along the bottom. Now, the important thing that's, that's unique and different about 
this reference architecture versus other IT management frameworks is that it, this is an actual legitimate reference architecture. Most of the other management frameworks that you have for the business of IT aren't architectures. They're, they're descriptive. This is a prescriptive architecture. Uh, it focuses in on uh, functional components, the application orientation, uh, as well as then the data objects and the flow of data between functional components. The, uh, the focus on application and data, the focus on interoperability is again unique to IT for IT uh, versus what we do with other IT management frameworks. So I think uh, it can't be reiterated enough. IT for IT, is, as Tony was mentioning, is something that is very unique. Uh, in the industry, it is different than what's come before it. It's building on top of uh, some of the great work that's been done to create things like Idle and uh, COVID, but it is different. And so these, these four aspects of this are really how it's different. The, the, the business-oriented approach, the service orientation, the data and application focus, and then that last one is, is a key and important one, the idea of this being an open standard, which is obviously part of what we do here at the Open Group. Now, one of the questions that we always get asked, oops, sorry about that, every time we give a presentation on IT for IT is, well, how's this fit with IDLE, right? The, the, the question that comes up every single time. And so it's important to understand that the different components of IT for IT fit in different places. That IT value chain uh, and the service model, those are really uh, higher order, bigger picture uh, sorts of conversations. Those are, um, those are really coming in at the top of the IT discussion. When we step down a level, we get into uh, some of the IT management frameworks that actually cover a similar scope, but at what I would consider to be a real process orientation. Right? That's what you see in IDLE and COBIT and, and ISO 20000. You, see it, you tend to see more of a process orientation, a best practice orientation. Um, the, the, next, the next set of stuff here really is um, uh, management frameworks that are double clicking on a specific functional component or a series of functional components. So they're that next level of detail. There are things like TOGAF that you would bring in to use when you're looking at how am I going to run the enterprise architecture functional component within an IT, manage, uh, an IT management framework. And then, and then once you've kind of figured out what you want to do at a detailed level uh, from a process standpoint, then you need to get into um, the, the data and application architectures, which is where we bring IT for IT back in. And then obviously something like Archimate can be used to visualize the, the entire conversation. Now, for me, when, when we use this at CCNC, we really look at IT for IT being used in, in three specific ways. Um, and, and we use this very often without ever bringing up the words architecture. Uh, I think Tony mentioned um, that, that architecture isn't necessarily what IT for IT is all about, although it is a fabulous reference architecture. Um, we're, we're having a different kind of conversation when we go in and try and talk IT for IT to start with. Uh, we use IT for IT as, as a great way to do a capability assessment across the IT function. To be able to look at an organization and figure out where the pain points are and really try to drive the conversation with the CIO around what's in your toolbox that we need to, to upgrade to, to help alleviate some of that pain. The second area that we use it really is uh, to kind of lay all this out and, and do an IT management tool rationalization. Um, I'll show you an example where I used that here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but trying to, to, to use this effectively, I keep hitting the button, sorry. Uh, trying to use this as an effective way to kind of lay out everything that you have and start to compare and contrast what works and what doesn't. Uh, it works very, very well for that, and I'll show you an example of when we've done that. And then the last uh, that we've got on here is, is really this idea of um, 
introducing a service orientation into the conversation. Uh, you hear uh, companies that talk about wanting to become service brokers with their IT organization, but they don't know how to do it. Uh, we very effectively have used IT for IT as a way to take that conversation to the next level and to help organizations do that. The big thing here, and obviously I put it in big bold letters so, so we would be real clear about that. For me, IT for IT provides context to the IT professional when they do their job on a day in and day out, day out basis. It gives them an understanding of what's going on outside of their world. It helps get them outside of their silos. I firmly believe that every IT professional in the industry needs to have a basic understanding of IT for IT for this very reason, to lift them up out of the day to day and help them see the bigger picture and give them a little bit of context so that they can do their job more effectively. I'm going to show you a couple real quick examples, and I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, but this is an example that we used um, to, uh, to kind of do that value stream assessment, just uh, one way to do it. You could do this any number of different ways, but it's trying to take a look at um, from, a, from a standpoint of how an organization was uh, doing in some of the various areas, just kind of quickly hit the, the high points and, and facilitate a conversation around where should we go next. Uh, and then this was an example of a, a tools rationalization effort that we were doing, kind of laying everything out, uh, taking a look at what do we have in the organization, where's the overlaps uh, against the various functional components from IT for IT. And, and this uh, also created some interesting conversations around what we had, where, where we had five or six tools that were playing in the same place across the organization, how we were going to drive rationalization off of that. So I want to turn this over to Dave. I think he's next. There you go. Thank you. This should mystify me. Good morning. I'm a management consultant. My job is helping organizations improve. It's interesting sitting here listening to the other presentations where they're talking about an IT organization. My clients are not the IT organization. I work for the business. We use IT for IT. In one of our cases, there isn't an IT organization in the company. They outsourced it. Why do they use IT for IT? So at Connexium, as management consultants, we start all of our stuff with standards. The work we're doing largely at the Open Group right now is around how you use these standards. Looking around the room, there's seven of us in the room. Why we're here is helping move forward and describe how you actually use these things. And we use IT for IT as an accelerator. My practice is aimed at transformation and changing organizations. We have a framework and a toolkit on how we describe an organization. In fact, I've got a bunch of slides in here where we're going to talk about how we describe an organization and then brought IT for IT in. Important thing for an organization that does management consulting and uses an architected approach is, I'm not changing anything because we've got IT for IT. The way we approach the problem is identical. I need to layer this in. Why? Because I'm enabling integration. Every one of our cases that we're looking at here is we were looking from the outside in. What IT capability does the business need to deliver what the business wants? not what IT wants to provide. It's a very interesting approach. Not one of our clients is constrained by an IT organization's view of itself. In fact, many of the services that when we went through IT for IT and we mapped them out, looking at value streams, looking at service to portfolio, strategy to portfolio requirement to fulfill, are provided in and by the business. One of the mapping exercises we did was to identify the IT functions that IT doesn't do. Absolutely critical, because if you're going to succeed in, as was talking about, faster time to market, and you're going to be deploying an application that you've got three seconds before your consumer says, oh, sucks, moving on. What have you done there? Blowing your value apart. It's gone. 
because you've spent 100% of your cost to get an app out, you spent 100% of your marketing to get the consumer to try it, and you died. So, I got two clients we're gonna talk about. One is a public sector organization. The client's a huge consumer of IT capability. Every one of the products and services they provide to the citizens of their country are IT oriented. Whether it's uh, products enabling, uh, facilitating time to market for work visas or enabling transportation in a developing country, all IT operations are outsourced. One of the things that when we were going through was like, who's your IT organization? They say, we don't have one. We went through the organizational chart. Nobody in that company is responsible for IT. It's all outsourced. Now, every one of their IT-oriented products is also contracted. So what we identified in the chart here, and this is a deliverable with their names taken off, are the IT functions and who mapped them. We mapped it to the different organization. Interestingly, in this org, nobody's happy with IT. The irony being is there is no one to be unhappy with. <laughs> Second one is a financial services company. Clients embarking on a massive change, a major transformation. And as with most businesses, they are incredibly dependent upon IT capability. Products and services. Think about trying to do banking, insurance, any of that without having IT capability handy. You can't do it. Now how do you transform your business? So what we're chasing here is an organization that needs to dramatically improve its time to market and its efficiency and its customer engagement. And again, where's the IT organization? They have a major platform that is developed by the business. Now this business unit has also completely outsourced all of its IT functions. They have somebody else providing their platform. They have another person providing their sustainment. They have them now they're bringing in people to write code for them. Everything's out. So when we look at the method I mentioned that we have, we look at capabilities and there's third party services, processes, applications, and a capability for us is not something miracle or magical that's got a fancy definition. It's simply something you want to improve. The pieces underneath, and we score everything. We score to drive out requirement and goal and what you're actually trying to, to get there. And we score it on a series of attributes. So when we talk about a capability, we'll ask everybody, in this capability, are you chasing efficiency? Are you chasing fitness or value or output? Or are you chasing the ability to improve it? Then we look at each of the processes under the hood, competency, automation, and the application functionality. That's what we do as a normal course. So what we had for the first client, the public sector, we've identified 11 processes that they have to excel at to succeed. That was the competency question. That led into identifying 10, 11 capabilities that the business needs in order to succeed. So this is where we started. This is what my business needs. Now how do I map in and bring in IT for IT? I've got all these gaps, I've got my ability to move forward, and I now need to identify what my IT organization has to provide. So we took IT for IT, the reference model. Didn't worry about whether it was a functional component or what. I mapped it to my framework. Everybody's gonna do that. Took it apart and said, each of these functional blocks looks a lot like a capability, a thing to improve. We identified, I've gotta count them, five that are absolutely central. IT's ability to manage demand, to do fulfillment, incident management, requirements management, and financial management. Does it mean the rest of it isn't important? No. What it means is these are the ones that were required. Interestingly, not always by the IT organization. Some of them came from the business. If your business writes the portal as a product, where does an incident go to when the portal's not working? It's actually a business process that is incident management. Where does it go if you can't process a claim? It's not an IT issue. Claims aren't being processed. Mapping this out and pulling it out allowed us to look at which are the central capabilities the organization needed and which were the IT for IT capabilities that were needed under the hood. 
How does it line up? Now I've got an improvement plan. Now I've got a roadmap. I'm in a position to identify where my organization needs to improve. And I've got a nice consistent language. Also using IT for IT as an end-to-end -end flow. Here are all the things that are required for a good IT organization to exist. Now that IT organization is virtual. Where are they? And we identified a set of holes where this organization didn't have what it needed in order to simply work. And that's where all the breakpoints were. So we do an alignment of capabilities. Those scoring things, same scoring. What is it you've got now? What is it you want to improve? Where do you, are we chasing an efficiency problem? Are we chasing a fitness problem? Or are we chasing a manageability problem? Every one of those has a different improvement path. So the outcome, when we built this for in-house, because they are a heavy consumer of contracted services, that exact same capability model is now going into their RFPs so that they're in a position to identify what all of their service providers must provide. What's a roadmap to improve, plug and play, because we weren't talking about business IT alignment, we were talking about integration. There's no line particularly in that public sector organization, because there is no IT organization. They don't have a CIO. They have heads of business units who are delivering products and services that are very IT-centric. Next step for both of them is look inside at their key service providers. Having identified what it is they need, they've asked us to help them map up so that those service providers are in a position to deliver. So thank you very much for your time. Talk to you later. Hello, can you guys hear me? Uh, how you doing? Uh, my name's Luke Bradley. Uh, I work for Vodafone Group and my t job title is Principal Architect for uh, an organization called Technology Shared Services. So it, it's, Firstly, it's my first time being up on a stage like this and talking to a group of people like this. So apologies if I fumble along a wee bit, but I'll try my best not to. Um, so it's interesting listening to everybody else in terms of the types of challenges that people are having, particularly the last speaker around how the organization they're working with doesn't have an IT organization. Interestingly enough, we have loads of IT organizations. Vodafone as a company works as a federated model. There's 24 countries, all with their own CIO, of which I work for a group function with their own CIO. Uh, and while that CIO and CTO has a degree of control over what those countries do, they can largely, they can largely do what they want. The, the CEO locally has accountability for profit and loss, and thus you know, has certain power. Um, so in, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I'm probably going to take a bit of a deep dive into the tech to correct and why Vodafone Group, or, or why we, we, we looked at this at, sort of at depth, why we tried to use it within our program, uh, with that program still ongoing, and then why we'll, or why I'm personally championing maybe to use this broader framework uh, because of some of the challenges we're coming across. So, so as I mentioned, I work for an organization called Technology Shared Services, so it's a, it's a pretty diverse organization. It's 5,500 employees. Uh, I'm lucky to be principal architect for that organization. Don't know how that happened. But uh, it's part of a, a wider shared services organization of 22,000 people. I believe it's, it's despite being a, a relatively immature a new organization of two or three years old, uh, it's, I think, in the top three or four shared services organizations worldwide. Uh, what do we specialize in? So the full sort of spectrum of, of IT-type services, um, a lot of it is, is resource augmentation and sort of extended workbench type of stuff but we've reached a critical mass in terms of the, the, the sheer number of people that we're, we, we manage for, for other organizations that we probably were in a unique opportunity within Vodafone to transform. And a lot of that transformation is happening right in, in testing. We have, I think it's 1,100 full-time testers, thousands working for outsourced organizations. Uh, we have the largest HPE AL, apologies, one of the largest HPE ALM platforms um, in terms of application operations and maintenance and infrastructure management service desk. I think we've over two and a half thousand people working in that, in, in that area of the business. 
We have 42 remedy platforms. Uh, we have countless monitoring platforms, uh, all operating in silos, all with different perspectives on the world. Most of them resource focused, that's it. A uh, bit of network and security stuff, and in terms of trying to, some of the stuff we're trying to do, so we're trying to offer, we're offer I mean, value for money for, for a business that spends a lot of money on IT and a lot of money on technology, but on, particularly on outsourced providers, so we're, look, we're giving them an opportunity to bring stuff back in-house, but we're doing it quicker, and more often than not, we're doing it with higher quality. So. And so in terms of the specific program that I'm going to talk about, so I mentioned that uh, the, the broad sort of set of accountabilities I have, I have responsibility for, well, architecture accountability for a testing transformation program, monitoring transformation, service desk, uh, analytics, I'm going to say DevOps, even though I, I buy a little every time I say it, um, and a few other bits and pieces sort of going on. But in terms of the, the monitoring transformation and some of the operational application operations transformation that we're going through, that gives you an idea of some of the challenges that we had, or, and we still have, and that we're actually trying to fix. Um, in reality, uh, and it's probably a key point, is what, what, what is a service and what represents a service and what represents value is completely lost within the organization. Um, there is no, even beyond an architecture perspective, I could say there's no definition, but you know, it's, it's like, trying to, it's like a, it's trying to herd cats, to be honest. It's, it's very, very difficult to, to to discuss value within Vodafone when, when uh, sorry, press the button, um, when talking about this sort of stuff. So in terms of the transformation that we're going through, so we had four main areas. I've done my very best not to put people in, even though it's probably the most important bit, because uh, it would have been a bit cliche to mention the, the typical tree. But the, the service model that we're working with is probably the, the single most important thing. So the, this monitoring transformation has a, a scope of 16 countries, has 30,000 servers, three and a half thousand applications. And within that estate, you have pretty much every flavor of, from an infrastructure management perspective, Windows, Unix, blah, blah, blah. There's a couple of thousand Oracle databases in there. Uh, and then at an application level, uh, from an application platform, Java, blah, 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 every single challenge you, you could have there. They are 85% of which is, is, uh, is over six years old. So there's a lot of a, a, a large legacy estate there. And we're, but we're increasingly trying to move to more of a, an agile DevOps sort of type approach. So from an operations perspective, we have a challenge of, of managing a, an old legacy estate uh, while also you know, bringing in a lot of things very, very fast. So, so the service model is a, is a critical aspect of it. From a process perspective, I mentioned we have 42 service desks. That is 42 incident management processes. So as part of this, the monitoring transformation and bringing together the, the application operation perspective, we're very much in the process of standing the, standardizing that incident management process to a single framework. Change management is the same. Every market or every country loses, uses Remedy, uh, the change management module within Remedy in a different way. From a, an underlying reference data perspective, there, is, there isn't a CMDB that you could call trustworthy. From maybe an asset management within our data center, we, 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 we have something, but we're, we're, we're really, really struggling, to be honest. And the fact that we've got so far within some of these programs is an achievement itself. It's, it's pure blood, sweat, and tears very often. And, you know, um, but, you know, that's it. So in terms of, of, of what are we doing, so, so I mentioned this, some of this, the scale and the challenge of what we're having. So, this is essentially a high-level logical representation of what we're doing within monitoring. And that's not displaying properly, but sure. That's fine. Um, so given that the scale and the complexity of the environment that we're talking about, interoperability is the challenge. It, when we discuss with local markets, with CIOs, with, with, with the various operating countries, it's very hard for us to... to given the, the complexity of the architecture and stuff that we're working with, it's very hard for us to discuss what we're doing and why it's valuable to them. And, I, and I'll dive into this a bit so that on the next slide with the tech to correct and why that helps us. But this, this is pretty much a, a largely, from, a, from an architecture perspective, the deepest that we're able to go when discussing with, with, with local markets and CIOs. And essentially what we're trying to basically say here is, look, we're building a standardized layer, uh, all these, these, very, these three or four layers, at the middle where the red boxes are, it's shamelessly stolen from HP, this slide. But that is essentially uh, 
a set of off-the-shelf integrations that we use into your into your multiple tiers of service delivery. Whether it's and it's and it's centered around a monitoring service catalog. So whether you want to do infrastructure management, log management, or you want to go into advanced application performance management use cases, we essentially We'll work with you to whether we use our standard tool set or whether we or, or we'll do a sort of analysis on, on what those local markets have. And again, there's hundreds of tools in all of these areas. Uh, and depending on the level of risk, the scale of, of coverage, the cost of those platforms, we we'll either work with them to integrate those into this wider stack or to replace them with one of our standard capabilities. Um, I'll skip I'll let the animation go through. So this is as you can see, I'm probably, my, my, when I'm talking about this, it's, it's quite difficult to talk about it in 10 minutes. I normally have a set of slides, 30, 40 minutes, 30, maybe 20, 30 slides, that I could spend two or three hours talking about this. Going through it very, very quickly with a CI, with a C, or a CIO is, is an or a similar enough challenge to talk to you guys about what we're doing, particularly sometimes when you lack the context of the challenges we face. And I found that this one slide, and it's a, it's a variation of the detected correct slide from IT for IT, and while not using this in the most literal sense uh, and, and following through, I mean, when we started using it a year, year and a half ago, it was quite, still quite level. This has probably been the single most valuable slide that I've used at various stages through our program. And it immediately allows us to demonstrate to what is hundreds and, and even sometimes thousands of people within the organization that we touch with in all these countries what exactly we're doing. Um, and the, the, in terms of that bottom level, in terms of the Arc Enterprise Manager, the PHP OM agents, blah, 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 we can just swap those out into what are, whatever technology platforms are relevant uh, or tool platforms are relevant to that country. But how, we, how, how all of our various platforms, and when I said 32 or 42 remedy platforms, I, I was serious, they are the considerations that, that, that we have to solve. How do you do that knowledge management in that context when within a company who, who's won the headline stats that our, that our office IT organization used to give us an indication of how big we are, is that we have 80,000 SharePoint sites. So when you have 80,000 SharePoint sites, and that is a, apparently a positive, what do I do? There you go. Uh, and that's apparently a positive attribute. I mean, how do you discuss, you know, consolidating knowledge management into one uh, known error sort of database? All of these sort of bits and pieces as you go through the chain, uh, where you bring closing the loop in terms of taking that incident management, moving into continuous service improvement, managing defects. I mentioned the ALM platform, uh, how that brings into change management, but eventually how that finds itself back into production. Um, I went through that quite quickly. I'm looking at that clock; it's getting there very quickly. Um, that is that is essentially the most valuable slide within our program. Um, and thank you for listening. Cheers. Right, the tyranny of projects. Um, over the last two and a half, three years, we've been doing some stuff with the uh, UK regional service provider. Now, this is a provider whose plant, some of it is over 120 years old. Yeah, so it's not apps that we're dealing with particularly. Um, this is serving a lot of individuals, and if some of the uh, stuff falls over, people don't get to eat. So it's a very, um, it's a thing we have to be careful about. And uh, overall, if you include the distribution medium, we estimate there's something like 80 million serviceable things. That is, somebody can phone up and complain, my thing has gone wrong, send a man, and it's one of 80 million things that needs to be fixed. Some of them are 150 years old and at a depth of 100 feet underground. Yeah? So we actually can't afford to differentiate between the types of service that we supply. And we have got every kind of IT as well. We've got business IT, we've got SCADA, we've got embedded, we have you name it. Coming back to the point about mean time between failures, from the view of the customer, once in every 40 years. That's fine, that's the end customer. But 
that's actually not hellish great. It sounds good, oh, once in every 40 years. But that means we've got 5,500 failures every day. Something goes wrong. It could be an IT process. It could be a billing issue. It could be something. We don't differentiate between IT services, provision services, or any other service. They are all things that have to be fixed. So there is a significant load. And when we say help desk calls, what I mean there is the combination of help desk calls and trouble tickets. So 17,000 a day have to be sorted out. This then is the issue, and it's been mentioned several times, the customer experience. Um, the issue with customers is that they can be internal or external. And again, we actually don't give a damn. We should be treating them equally, internal or external. If you start doing stuff with projects, the big problem with projects, traditionally, is you have a long spin-up time, um, you have cumulative risk, you have delayed delivery, you have the problems of people, um, and then the thing fails and you've got a great big restart cost. Um, this is especially true, certainly in, the, in this country, with government projects. Um, some countries can run government projects other than we do it, shall we say. Um, but this is very typical of what you get when you're thinking about projects as a whole. And that's how the business feels. <laughs> but in fairness, that's also how IT feels about the business, trying to get answers and responses. It works both ways. So the culpability is across the board, if I can put it that way. Because business are providing IT with a service the service of provisioning them with instructions of what they actually want. So this business that we have of IT somehow being subservient um, is wrong. It was mentioned before that uh, people don't like to discuss mean time between failures and stuff like that. But from the position of this corporation, this is absolutely critical to understanding what we mean by a service. Um, let me just get this forward a bit. So, if you look at the lifetime of any bit of plant, any bit of hardware, any system, any process, you have three areas. You have the infant mortality bit, dead out of box, if you will. That tends to be fairly high. Then you come to a prolonged period where stuff is okay, and then it begins to fall over. And it's the falling over, it's the end of life bit that we actually have to, where we have our problems. Useful life, business as usual, isn't a problem. What we then do is we look at the number of intersections by the customer, whatever that means, and we find it's absolutely related to the age of the plant. That is to say, the older the plant is, the closer it is to its uh, end of life, the more likely we are to have a call about it. And again, this is independent of the kind of plant it is. It can be IT plant, it can be a process, it can be a valve, whatever. So we don't differentiate between these things. The only way to handle this is actually to get away from bulk renewal projects. Big chunks of things that are going to last eight years. Now, if you have some plant that's buried 100 feet underground and it's a kilometer long, then obviously it's a big project. However, it's the smallest sensible building block size. And that really is the critical thing, is you have to analyze your services to the smallest sensible building block size. Therefore, there is no rule. It has to be done by people, live. So this is the challenge, basically. What we have to do is we've got to move Agile to the left, pretty much. Um, strategy has to be delivered in an Agile way. That's not something that corporations are used to. It's not something they enjoy, and it's very uncomfortable. Therefore, it's good. 
So what we'd like to do is, I suppose this is a bit like agile sprints if you're in that world. Um, the process cycle is by what we call now accelerated delivery. We don't call it agile, because that's a real turn off that word nowadays. We call it accelerated delivery. It was mentioned before, I think by Dave, exactly the same thing. Um, there is nothing new. And you put guys like you all in a room to think over the same problem, you'll come up with similar stuff. It's inevitable. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to have multidisciplinary teams of experts that we can get together, who can sit down in a short period of time and fix the problems. And uh, these delivery streams, which is what they are, we found out recently map exactly onto the IT for IT framework, which is good news for us because it means that we've now got something to hook stuff into standards-wise that people will understand worldwide as it happens. So we're looking for assets, customers, money. It's all about money. When in doubt, follow the money. Um, and then we hit this bottom thing, which is business value. And as been mentioned, business value is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Who knows what business value is? Nobody, especially accountants. Now, this is the way it works. Um, from our point of view, basically, a service is the intersection of a capability and a customer. And the customer can be inside or outside. It really doesn't matter. In fact, externality is merely interesting if you're serious about doing this stuff at all levels. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the um, business directors to understand that we want to do short cycle works. We want to deliver bits at a time, the smallest unit that, of service that can be handled. Um, if it's a big major project, a huge replacement, that is still the minimum sensible thing to do. Now, there's various ways of doing it. Um, we can uh, drop stuff through the pipe and on a continuous basis, or indeed, we can have uh, a more continuous process, which is in here, you get these slides afterwards, so it doesn't matter. So here we identify the capability, we then decompose that cross-functionally, we prioritize it using capability champions, and then we put it in the hopper, waiting for it to go. The product owner prioritizes the hopper cards, and the team does what has to be done. That's uh, just to juxtapose projects to work streams. And the whole point is that a project basically says, here's some money, spend it evenly over the period. Whereas the work stream said, here's some money, how quickly can I see the value from it? It's a slightly different way of looking at things. Accountants don't like it, therefore it's good. So, might feel uncomfortable. And uh, maybe not. Continuous delivery, continuously evolving, incrementally and constantly. Service catalog. IT for IT is for the IT service catalog. It's no different from any other service catalog from any other part of the business. We extend and use the principles of IT for IT right through. The fact is IT is purely incidental. And therefore, we can understand how it relates to IT for IT. As a result, this is how we feel. And this is how our management feels. So, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, all of you. If you could uh, please take a seat while we get some uh, questions from the audience. Pandas in the snow and pigs in muck. Huh? That's it. Nice. Perfect management description. Okay. 
So we do have a, a few few questions uh, coming from the audience. Um, start off with, what does IT for IT mean for the ITSMF community? Do you think? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing IT SMF is IT service management. Yes. Yeah, I can take this one if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think um, IT for IT is really going to be the next generation of IT management frameworks for uh, the IT SMF community. I think um, it's going to build on top of and work with what IDLE has uh, has done so well for that community. Um, I think it's going to really elevate and take uh, the the practice of that entire community to the next level. To me, it's a perfect fit with the goals and objectives of ITSMF. Um, it, it it covers the same scope, the same um, the same space that that they're after. Uh, I, I don't think uh, I don't think you could ask for better alignment between the two. We'll move swiftly on from that one. Um, we've heard how IT for IT can be used to transform IT management. What's your experience on how this affects sourcing your vendors to deliver on and support the new IT management approach? I can answer that, everyone. Please, Luke. Um, Luke. So I went through the, the, the slides earlier on uh, quite quickly, probably somewhat little context, so I appreciate it if you somewhat struggle to follow. Um, the platforms that we have are, are the largest platforms are, are certainly in the top three worldwide in from stuff from HP, from BMC, and blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the challenges that we bring to them and the scalability challenges and the interoperability challenges that we bring to them are, are, are far greater than, than, the, than the encounter in the vast majority of, their, of their, their, their customers. So what we've done, the slide that I showed um, is a very good way of, of communicating our, our vision, or is a very effective way of communicating our, communicating our vision of how all of these products work together uh, to them. That in itself, you would think that the HPEs and BMCs of the world would understand and, and immediately understand how, how they fit into a wider ecosystem, but, but they really struggle to, to, to map into, into the complexity of Vodafone on the ground. Uh, the program that, we, that we're doing, we opted to deliver ourselves because HP struggled to take it from a high-level consultancy perspective uh, down to the reality on the ground, uh, and the same with Accenture. Um, so we're starting to work with them, um, and it's part of the reason why I'm here is we're working quite closely with HP to figure out how we can, can leverage IT for IT internally within our organization, but within their, the, within their product teams. Um, we're doing a work, bit of work with uh, them on the product Propel at the moment um, as, as a possible solution to integrate our, our many remedy platforms and all of the adapters that they have within Service Exchange for Propel uh, are built uh, to the IT for IT framework in terms of interoperability. So, so just, it's, it's little things like that. It's not, it doesn't ne isn't necessarily major sort of jumps. We, we really want to build in requirements to RFPs and stuff like that, but, but just in terms of starting a discussion to, around basic improvements has proved very, very useful. Yeah, I sit on the, um, the IT for IT steering committee and and this topic is, is an important one that, um, that we've talked several times on the steering committee. And if I had a, one of those roadmap disclaimer slides that uh, people give, I'd put that up there right now because this is, this is a future forward-looking statement and no promises as to when it'll be delivered. But um, within the IT for IT uh, forum, what we're working on right now is uh, trying to take the standard to the next level of detail to be able to drive interoperability between vendors, to be able to, um, to, to kind of lay out what are the uh, APIs that we need to have between functional components to enable tools to work together more effectively and efficiently. So as this standard continues to evolve, and as I mentioned, uh, in the very first slide that I presented, this is an evolving standard. Um, but as this standard continues to evolve, we will see more and more detail available that will help drive uh, the vendor community to be able to 
uh, work together more effectively and drive interoperability across their tools. I think that's an important aspect of where we're heading with IT for IT. The other aspect of it, we're using it immediately to line up to what vendors must provide. IT for IT provides a business reference model for an IT organization or an IT service provider. If you need different functional components or different elements of the value stream, you can identify what you need and also your interaction points. Whether you are having an interaction in strategy or in fulfillment or in detect to correct, now you're in a position having identified what a full service or, or end to end organization needs to provide, what are your touch points? Different organizations will have touch points at different points. I may not care about my service provider strategy. I may only care about my service provider's incident response because that's my interaction. Alternatively, I may not care at all about their incident response and I might care completely about how they manage their portfolio because that's the services I'm in, I'm, and where I'm engaging with them. So we do use it right now, and for, for the, the public sector client, the mapping of what are the services that are absolutely critical is what they're using in their ability to assess their service providers. Uh, for the financial services organization, it's about to embark on a half billion dollar transformation project. Um, we're building exactly the same map for all of the service providers. Yeah, we, we, we are starting to see some companies start to incorporate IT for IT directly into RFPs using that same context that Dave was talking about. Yeah. Well, that was a, a somewhat related question that, that we had in, which is uh, how can IT for IT help me as my organization increasingly moves to a cloud software as a service type organization, and should I be requiring my vendors to use it? I don't know if you should require or necessarily require your vendors to use it, but if it's how you think about your cloud services. So if you're acquiring cloud services, where are you on the journey and what services are you assembling? Are you buying um, cloud services that are being assembled or are you doing self-assembly? If you're doing self-assembly, then you're going to care deeply and want to engage in their roadmap and portfolio plan. If it's being assembled for you, you're probably more concerned about how they fulfill. Um, <laughs> but it, it's painfully obvious. It's why, we, it's why my practice rapidly adopted it. It's like, here's a complete description of what, I, what you need in, a, in the business of operating an IT organization or a service provider. And in fact, we're shamelessly stolen IT for IT and used it for other service provisioning that have nothing to do with IT. Take all of the IT references off and you've got I need a section on my strategy, I need a section on my portfolio. Yep, exactly that. Um, it, it's just a, a good generalized framework, um, like just the same way that enterprise architecture came out of IT and crawled out of the mud and went into the business. Uh, IT for IT does something similar as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's just a jolly good thing. <laughs> jolly good thing, excellent. <laughs> Presumably when architecture was in the mud, it was meeting the management rolling around in the mud. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question was specifically aimed, um, uh, at least to start with, at, well, okay, ultimately at Luke. Has the use of IT for IT and detect the correct improved value inside Vodafone? If so, what value and how do you measure it? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so when I touched on the, the service model or, or what we call the a global business service catalog internally, the, the multiple organizations is quite, probably quite relevant. Um, so each of the local countries uh, have accountability for the, the business processes within that organization. Um, the, the local IT organizations tend to have ownership for, for application operations. And then there's a central infrastructure operations organization. Um, and what each of those layers describe as a service and how they measure service uh, are all very different and, and you know, what value to each of those is, is all very different. So in terms of our, the global business service catalog that we've done has basically integrated those, those, tier, those tiers across those organizations um, vertically, but, but also we're standardizing each of those countries onto a, 
a single definition of a service. Um, you know, if you're in Ireland or whether you're in the UK or Spain or, 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 or India, you're, you're going into a Vodafone shop to buy an iPhone or you're going onto the, the website to, to do a change of package plan or change your address or blah, blah, blah. But each of the countries describe them as something different. Uh, and then the central infrastructure organizations just taught servers were the world uh, and ignored why, why they were there. So, so going back to the question, we, we track availability and performance, uh, just report on that very basic KPI at a, at a business process level. So we're, we're, only, we're only three or four months live into the program. We've, for the first country, we've 20 out of 150 of the business processes live. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's sort of, it's trending in the right direction, but it's, we're, we're tuning and refining the data. So it's a bit of a up and down where the, the, the real solid numbers are, are and value are is within the operations functions themselves. So within the application operations le level, the actual number of instances largely stayed the same despite the, the number of monitors and what we're looking at uh, increasing dr dramatically. Um, the overall number of events that, uh, at that, despite the number of uh, incidents that we need to handle being largely the same, the number of events that our global monitoring organization that we're also setting up are actually handling for the first local market is down around 30%. So it's down from about 80,000 a month down to 60,000. But it's, it's, it's on the first time fix within that organization where the real benefits are. So, so up to this point, the, the, that organization maybe we're able to fix around, I think it was 12, 13% uh, of incidents within the, within the first level function. So I think that's up to 48% now in just four months. Uh, and then the infrastructure organization, the number of events are down from, I think it's 4.8 million down to 1.4 million uh, events to, to handle in, in four months after that number pr remaining pretty solid for the last five, six years. Um, the number of incidents is down, but I can't think of the figure off the top of my head. But the, the real solid number, again, is the first time fixed. So it's gone from 0% to 47%, again, in that period of time. So um, w within a shared services organization, the business, uh, touched at the various different value levels, are senior execs who, who measure the, the success of shared services. Obviously, it's largely a financial discussion. So our, our uh, employee pyramid in terms of skill levels, et cetera, is actually up to this point was quite top heavy. It's starting to actually flatten or widen out at the bottom of it. Uh, we have a lot of graduates doing a lot of work that previously high skilled people often unsure would have to do. So, so yes, absolutely. There's a lot of value. Thanks, Luke. So just time for one last question. And, and if you can, uh, the, the question is, if you can pick one thing about IT for IT that you have seen resonate with your customers, what would it be? The fact that we had to define what we meant by a service. Okay. Anyone else? One thing that it would resonate. Um, it's the value chain. The piece that resonated most strongly with the conversations we had is what the definition of value is. If you look at the value chain, it says the thing of beauty on, on the right-hand side, it says what the value of IT is. Everything drives to it. It's two words. Agility and efficiency. Everything else is noise. He stole mine. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I jokingly say, we used to, all of the tools, we have everything. We, we've enterprise license agreements with every tool vendor in the world. Literally everything you could possibly imagine, but there's no value being extracted from them. The, the, there's been countless up attempts to try to get value and standardize and simplify and centralize they've all failed because it's a very complex organization. I said that one slide has allowed me to, I'm going to say very simply, sell within the organization very, very effectively and has got us to a point that is significantly ahead of, of where any other attempt has gotten. Yeah, I, w I, I would build on it. The, the, the value chain uh, for me, I've, I've talked with over the last 18 months probably uh, 100 plus uh, people from from people that have just started to IT in IT to um, very experienced CIOs and that IT value chain resonates with every single one of them with sole exception of one right so out of all those people one person didn't get that right. and 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 when you run in that kind of a percentage over 99 percent um, 
there's something there that's that's working. Um, it's it's really pretty powerful. Great, thank you, uh, gentlemen. We're we're out of time. We're going to go to the uh, to the break. But uh, before we do, please um, round of applause for Mike Fulton, Luke Bradley.